These are four of potentially the worst contracts in NHL history, starting with Brad Richards, who signed a nine-year contract for $60 million with the New York Rangers in 2011. The contract was structured so he would make $12 million his first two seasons, making him the highest paid player in the NHL. I want to make an important note here. Players and teams are always trying to negotiate the best contract possible for themselves. At the end of the day, the NHL is a business and the player's livelihood. So I'm not trying to be negative towards any player. I'm just trying to explore why these giant contracts didn't end up working out. Well, in Brad Richards' case, things actually started out fine. When he signed the deal, the coach of the Rangers said, forget about what the stats are. Forget about what the on-ice says. It's some of the mentoring and just teaching kids what it is to be a pro with such a young crew we have. So it's clear they wanted him to be a leader. But when you're the highest paid player in the league, it's also hard to ignore your stats. So... How did he do? Well, his first season, he played all 82 games and scored 66 points, which was 11 less than the previous season, where he played 10 games less, and it was 25 points less than two seasons ago where he played 80 games. In the playoffs, he played 25 games scoring 12 points, which was similar to the previous year's playoff performance. His next season saw his production slip further getting 34 points in 46 regular season games. But what really stood out was in 10 playoff games, he only got one point. In his third season at the trade deadline, the Rangers traded away their captain, Ryan Callahan. Brad Richards stepped up and acted as the unofficial captain and led the New York Rangers to the Stanley Cup Finals. However, his scoring production went down again, getting 51 points in 82 games in the regular season, and in the playoffs, he got 12 points in 25 games. At 34 years old, he still has six years left on his contract. He would make on average $6.6 .6 million per season, and with it looking like his scoring wouldn't return to previous form, the New York Rangers decided to buy out his contract, meaning he got two-thirds of his remaining contract, and all of his signing bonus that was still owed, which equaled roughly $20 million. He would go on to sign a $2 million contract with the Blackhawks and help them win the Stanley Cup the next year. He would then sign a $4 million deal with the Red Wings, and at the end of the season at the age of 36, Brad Richards would announce his retirement. Rick DiPietro was selected first overall in the 2000 NHL entry draft, making him just one of three goalies ever selected with the first pick. The Islanders traded away their current young goalie Roberto Luongo, and expectations for Rick DiPietro started to build sky high, as it was clear the Islanders already wanted him to be their franchise goalie. It's talk that Roberto Luongo has been traded, and we heard the Kevin Weeks deal, so uh, you are their future. How does that feel? Oh, it feels unbelievable. It's a, it's a lot of pressure, but uh, something that I really, uh, really want to be able to jump into and handle, and uh, I think uh, it'll be a, a great fit. His rookie season didn't go well for him or the Islanders, ending up with a 3-15 and record, an 878 save percentage, and a 3.49 goals against average. But by his third and fourth year, he started to find his footing and became a solid starting goalie, putting up a 9-11 save percentage in the 2004-2005 season and a 900 save percentage in the 2005-2006 season. The Islanders were very excited with his progress and thought they finally found their franchise goalie, so they were willing to give him a big contract, but I don't think anyone was expecting what they ended up giving him. Before the 2006-2007 season, Rick DiPietro signed a 15-year, $67.5 million contract. With the NHL salary cap in 2006, Rick DiPietro Pietro was making around 10% of the Islanders' salary cap, again, setting fans, management, and teammates' expectations sky high. And at first, it did seem like an okay deal. In the 2006-2007 season, DiPietro put up a 919 save percentage and helped the Islanders make the playoffs, but he also started to get injured. In 2007, he got two concussions during the season, and in the offseason, he had to get surgery after a hip injury. In the 2007-2008 season, his save percentage dipped down a bit to 908, and he ended up missing the last bit of the season for another hip surgery. Injuries ended up plaguing him for the rest of his career, and he was never able to play a full season again. The closest thing was in the 2010-2011 season, where he was mostly healthy up until he had a goalie fight, where a punch fractured his face. He still ended the season with 26 games and a low 886 save percentage. The constant injuries and declining statistics led the New York Islanders to buy him out of his contract in 2013, with eight years left. The buyout was for two-thirds of his remaining contract, which was $24 million spread over 16 years. So he'll be making $1.5 million every year until 2029. DiPietro now works in sports broadcasting, hopefully staying far away from any more injuries. The number one draft pick in 2001, a year after Rick DiPietro was selected, was Ilya Kovalchuk, drafted by the Atlanta Thrashers. He proved to be an amazing goal scorer and an electric player. So in 2005, when it was time to give him a new contract, Atlanta delivered. He signed a five-year $32 million deal, taking up a little over 16% of Atlanta's salary cap. Kovalchuk remained an elite player and became the captain of the team. In fact, he is actually still the leading goal scorer for the Winnipeg Jets with 328 goals, even though he never played a game for them. 
In the 2009-2010 season, he was in contract negotiations with the Atlanta Thrashers, but nothing could be agreed upon. So Atlanta switched to looking for a trade, and with 27 games left in the season, he was traded to the New Jersey Devils. Kovalchuk did his thing and got 27 points in the last 27 games, making a strong case for a new contract. The Devils agreed and offered him an almost unbelievable contract, 17 years for $102 million. But it didn't last long, because almost immediately the NHL came in and rejected it, because it circumvented the NHL salary cap. It was structured so he would earn $98.5 million the first 11 years, and just $550,000 per year in the last 5 years. The Devils redid the contract this time, 2 years shorter at 15 years and $100 million. The contract was still front-loaded, but a little less than the previous one. And this time, the NHL accepted the contract, making Kovalchuk a New Jersey Devil until the 2024-2025 season. But bizarrely, just 3 years into the deal, Kovalchuk announced his retirement from the NHL. He then signed with SKA St. Petersburg, a KHL team. He wanted to be closer to family, and there are reports that he was going to make a substantial amount more money in the KHL than the NHL. Kovalchuk still had $77 million left on his NHL contract when he retired, and the New Jersey Devils are still paying a $250,000 cap recapture penalty to this day, and will until the 2024-2025 season. In 2018, after playing in the KHL for a few years, Kovalchuk decided to rejoin the NHL, and got a three-year $18.75 million contract with the LA Kings. A year and a half into the deal, the Kings placed him on unconditional waiver and his contract was terminated. He played professionally as recent as the 2020-2021 season in the KHL. For now, it looks like he has retired, but you never know. What I do know is that Wade Redden became the highest paid player in the AHL for two seasons. Redden started his career with the Ottawa Senators in 1996, and he became one of the cornerstone players and an alternate captain for the team. He is still the fifth all-time Senators player in points scored at 410. But after the 2007-2008 season, Ottawa wanted to move on, and he didn't exactly have his best year. In 80 games, he got 6 goals, 32 assists, totaling 38 points. Wade Redden became a free agent and ended up striking a deal with the New York Rangers. The Rangers offered him a 6-year, $39 million contract. His first two seasons with New York saw his play and stats slip further. In the 2008-2009 season, in 81 games, he got 3 goals, 23 assists for 26 points. And then in the 2009-2010 season, in 75 games, he got 2 goals, 12 assists for 14 points. Fans and management alike weren't happy, and his 6.5 yearly salary becomes a problem when you have a league like the NHL with a hard salary cap. So for the 2010-2011 season, the Rangers assigned him to their AHL team, the Hartford Wolfpack. With this move, he would still be making his full salary, but it wouldn't affect the New York Rangers' salary cap. It also made him the highest paid player in the NHL for two seasons. Then, the 2012 NHL lockout happened. With it, some rule changes followed. One of them was basically the Wade Redden rule, that any player in the minors making more than 900000 would count against their NHL affiliate salary cap. With the new rule, the Rangers then decided to buy out the remaining two years of Redden's contract. He then signed a one-year $800,000 contract with the Blues, and then was traded to the Bruins, where he would finish the year and his playing career. He has since been inducted in the Senators' Ring of Honor, and now works as the Senators' player development coach. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe.